Father, thank you so much, Lord, for giving us another opportunity, Lord, that we brothers and uh, we sisters could come together as one family and to meditate your word, O oh Lord, to study your word, to encourage each other in our faith and in our spiritual walk, O oh Lord. Lord, the our time we are going to spend in fellowship and uh, in discussion and of learning, Lord, I pray your name be exalted and this may be a time that edify us and equip us, Lord. We ask for your special grace upon Sachin as he is going to teach about the uh, gospel of Luke to us, Lord. We want to hear your voice through him. You open our hearts, our understanding, so that we may be able to receive and perceive your revelation. And the discussions we are going to make may be meaningful and be acceptable in your sight. The, our, the time we spend here, Lord, may bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let me share my screen so that we can start. Okay. Now this one can go. Perfect. So very good evening to all of you. Uh, we continue with our journey with the New Testament survey. Our word about a uh, survey is that in in survey we don't uh, we don't read or learn one book in particular or we don't go deep uh, in in that book but in a through a survey what we do is we quickly uh, glance it over the book we quickly glance it over the entire new testament but when we glance what do we do uh, we see uh, who is the author we learn more about uh, who were the intended recipient when it was written uh, what were the political or, or geopolitical situation at that time so that we can more understand what were the context, how it is written and why it is written. And so that this information, when you do your personal study, it is it helps you to do then the interpretation properly. So through survey, we'll be glancing it. And today we will continue with a, a, a study of the gospel according to Luke. Now, in our last session, we learn more about parables, why Jesus used parables and how to interpret them. So today we'll learn more about the gospel according to Luke or our Dr. Luke. Now, a bit overview. Uh, Luke's gospel was originally the first scroll of the two volume work, act being the second um, part of the scroll. Now these volumes, it comprise approximately one quarter of the New Testament, one quarter, making Luke and Act together the largest New Testament book. But the contemporary readers can easily miss out this fact because of the introduction of the uh, book of uh, Gospel of John in between them. But when originally composed and sent to Theopolis, as we read it in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4 in the introduction, and also in the introduction, introductory part of Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, they were supposed to be uh, read as a single narrative about Jesus and his disciples. So that was the fact. Now, Luke's uh, account speaks eloquently of God's salvation, first sent to Jewish people, and then to the Gentile throughout the Mediterranean world. Now the story of empire wide spread of the gospel is told in a way that also emphasize how this salvation is offered to all the people. The far off also, as we read in Acts chapter two, verse 39. Now, regardless of ethnicity, nationality, social class, gender or age, the gospel just spreads. Now here we watch the church proclaim the message not only to Jew, but also to Samaritans, Ethiopian official, Roman, Macedonians, Greek, uh, 
and the barbarians as the gospel spreads to the end of the earth as we read in acts chapter 1 verse 8 now in luke's gospel the poor have the gospel preached to them the poor have the gospel preached to them women become full participants in god's salvation and even children are welcomed by jesus people who are of the social area such as tax collector or they are classified as sinners they also enter into god's kingdom so luke's story is about the offer of salvation to those who are on the outside to those marginalized by the society that's about luke uh, luke's uh, the the gospel of luke now a little bit about author now, ever since the second century, the third gospel in the canon has been known as the gospel according to Luke. Now, Luke didn't put his name on the book, but the early church did. Now, early church tradition is unanimous in calling the author Luke. The most likely reason for this unanimity is that it is how it actually happened. But what do we know about Luke, our author? Now, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10 to 11 suggests that he is a Gentile. Paul says, Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus Justice were the only circumcised people with him. Later, in verse 14 of chapter 4, he mentioned Luke, the beloved physicians, implying that Luke was not a uh, is not a circumcised person so that that makes uh, suggest that he was a gentile now luke's style shows that he is a well educated person because he begins his book with a well structured prologue and he was able to use different styles in his writing as we uh, we read uh, septuagenital style in luke chapter 1 and 2 a courtroom, courtroom style defense in the speeches in Acts and other variations. But what does all this mean to us for understanding the gospel of Luke? Not much. Because the author does not claim to be an eyewitness of Jesus' life. He simply claims to have done a, some careful research as we read it in the chapter 1 of the introduction. Now the fact that Luke went uh, later went on a mission journeys with Paul does not seem to have affected his gospel. That's about the, our author Luke. Now let's see a bit on the setting. Now books were often dedicated to the person who paid the publishing expenses during that time. Now book publishing was done by paying people uh, to copy everything by hand. That was how it was published during that day. Now. Uh, Luke dedicates his book to Theopolis, which means lover of God. Now the name might be real or it could be a code name for someone in the Roman administration uh, who didn't want it to be uh, to go public with the interest in Jesus. You know, the title, the most excellent might indicate that he uh, is an official or a worthy benefactor. Now the name could also mean a literary fiction. That means inviting everyone who loved God to read um, uh, to read the book as if it were aimed towards them. The book seems to have an extra emphasis on the matter of wealth and money, which makes one think that Theopolis is a real person, even if that's not his real name, but that is a real person. Now, we don't know where Theopolis and others were located, although Rome and Greece has been suggested. Perhaps these books were distributed to Paul's churches and the readers were most likely Gentiles. Why? For when Luke presents Jewish customs, he includes explanatory phrases uh, that help its readers understand their meaning. For example, in um, chapter 22, verse 1, Luke says, Now the festival of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. 
a Jewish audience would hardly need this explanation about the Passover. Now, what Matthew calls a scribe, Luke calls a lawyer. We see in Matthew 23, 13 and Luke 11, uh, 11, chapter 11, verse 52 in the verse NASB. A term, lawyer is a term more understandable to Gentiles. The way Luke traces Jesus' genealogy back to Adam instead of Abraham, as we read in Luke 3, verse 38, underscore that the salvation is for the Gentiles. Now, what's the purpose of writing the book? Now, Luke state his purpose very clearly to assure his readers that the message about Jesus is true. Now, we do not know whether the readers had any serious doubts about the story or whether Luke is simply reinforcing a fact uh, that uh, reinforcing a faith uh, that already exists. Now, based on the content of Luke, we might suspect that this kind of company that the believers were keeping were possibly causing the wealthy uh, people to wonder uh, what's happening. You know, like, for example, Theop Theopolis would have wondered whether this movement, uh, which is filled with lower class people, is it Jewish or Gentile in nature? So there was a classification there. Now, let's go a little bit on date. And when was the Gospel of Luke was written? Now, the major question of for dating is whether Luke was written before or after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Why this question comes? Because Luke write it so clearly about the destruction of the temple. And let's explore, was it before um, the destruction or was it after? Now, Luke uh, in chapter 19, verse 43 to 44 and verse 21 to 6 says that the enemy would barricade around the city of Jerusalem, besiege it and then level it. Then he goes further on uh, saying in chapter 21 verse 24 that the survivors would have taken as captives. Now the author De Silva writes, Luke's gospel is the most explicit of all the three synoptic gospel concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. Now the question is whether Luke could have known this before it happened? Now, this is not answered by a literary evidence, but by the advanced assumption of the scholar. Now, let's explore that. Uh, let's explore this point. So now, if Jesus thought that the Jewish nation had broken the covenant, it would not be unreasonable for him to predict that the nation would be punished in the same way that it had been before, number one. An enemy would come to destroy the city and its temple. That's number two. Now, even in the early 60s, it would not be difficult to predict because the Jewish people at that time were headed for revolt, which would cause what would happen, which would cause Roman to take a punitive action. And it would not be difficult to assume how Roman seeds and techniques were working that day. So even without appealing to inspiration, Luke would have made the predictions before AD 70. That is one area. Now, Luke seems to try to explain where the Christian movement came from. And he tries to explain why Gentiles are in this moment. Now, both these apologetic needs would become less urgent if he would have written it in second century. Because by that time, Paul's letters were across all the places. So that's the another reason. Now, another clue that we have about the date of Luke is from the book of Acts. Now, Acts ends with Paul in Rome at about AD 62. But it, and, and it does not mention Paul's death. Now, some take this as an evidence that Act was written in early 60s and that the Gospel of Luke probably written a little before the book of Acts. But then on the other hand, uh, Luke would have had several reasons not to mention the death of Paul, even if he knew about it. Some, some uh, scholars think he might have been saving it for his third volume, uh, 
and wanted his second volume probably to end on a positive note. So we don't see a very uh, conclusive evidence about the date of Acts. No matter what, the gospel may have been written several years earlier than Act and it could have been uh, edited or published afterward. Now, another possible setting would be during Paul's imprisonment. Now, one of the V section of Acts begin when Paul sails to Caesarea towards Rome, as we read in Acts 27 verse 1. It seems that Luke had been in Judea while Paul was in prison. This would, this would have been a great time for Luke to do research and the life and ministry of Jesus. Luke could have written his gospel in those years, staying near Paul to help with his medical needs. Now, another issue with that is the manuscript might not have survived the shipwreck on Malta. Other reason is that Luke would have had two more years of waiting in Rome in which he would have rewritten it again. Now, perhaps it this is when he discovered the gospel of Mark and was able to integrate his research into Mark's framework. But VA, th these all assumptions, we are working on a very slender evidences and with some guesses as to how needs developed in an unknown, unknown region in the first century church. Now, thankfully, the date doesn't seem to be important for understanding what the book says. The date is important for assessing the historical accuracy of what it says. And that is why we read when it was written, because we need to know how, how where the historical situation is. Now let's go a little bit about Luke's story about Jesus. Now here, his main interest lies in the presentation of God's salvation as revealed in Jesus Christ. God's salvation as revealed in Jesus Christ. Now the author Ian Howard Marshall, he says, whereas the stress in Mark is on the person of Jesus, in Matthew on the teaching of Jesus, and in John on the manifestation of eternal life in him. But for Luke, he stresses on the blessing of salvation which he brings. Now you see the salvation has many nuances in the gospel of Luke, such as the healing from, of healing from disease, as we read in verse 17 to 19 and 18 verse 41 to 42, liberation from uh, demonic control, restoration of life to dead, uh, life uh, to the dead, and rescue from disaster. And salvation is also tied to the forgiveness of sin as we read in chapter 7 verse 49 to 50 and is also related to response of faith. Now yet the realities of forgiveness, liberation and healing are not separate and distinct but the aspect of total salvation that Jesus brings. This is a very important thing that Luke brings total salvation from all the things that we read. Now the combined volume of Luke and Act emphasize the significance of salvation on a broader scale. Now Stephen in Acts 7.25, he spoke of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt and even that prefigured the salvation of God offered to all humanity. Now, salvation for Luke is the deliverance God brings in the age to come, which has already dawned by the coming of Jesus. Now, Jesus proclaims to Zacchaeus in uh, Luke chapter 19 verse 10, for the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. God is the ultimate source of salvation, which he accomplished it through his son. Now the two volumes of uh, Luke and Act narrate in a very singular continuous story. The book are structured in a way and common themes appear in both volumes, such as the role of the Holy Spirit that we see in Luke 4, Acts chapter 2 and the theme of salvation. The pattern in which the history of Jesus and the early church presented are very symmetrical. 
have a view here. You could see the theme flows across the same manner in Luke and Acts. Well, moreover, the unity of the two book is seen in a way that act present the fulfillment of events that are predicted in Luke. Amazing, right? Such as the events, uh, such as the witness of the disciples, Luke 24, Acts chapter 1, and the persecution they will suffer, we read, in, read it in Luke chapter 22, uh, Acts 4, 5 onward. The disciple proclaims the same message of the kingdom of God that Jesus announces. Now we can understand Luke's literary structure, the book, by identifying its four principles. Now first, Luke, uh, after the introductory prologue, Luke described Jesus' infancy and John the Baptist ministry. Then he follows Mark's closely as he tells Jesus' ministry in Galilee. The response of people is favorable. He takes the, the or he, he chooses this, this entire structure from Mark. Third, uh, then follows Luke's travel narrative where Jesus traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem. The central theme is the rejection of Jesus and the seeming failure of his ministry. It begins with the Samaritans rejection of Jesus as we read it in nine, uh, chapter nine, Luke 51 to 56, and ends up with Jesus lament over unresponsive Jerusalem in chapter 19, verse 41 to 44. And the fourth aspect is Luke returns to then Mark's outline as he describes Jesus' work in and around Jerusalem. He takes it fully from Mark. Now, that means how is the, the out, uh, outline of Luke's gospel? Let's see. We have prologue, then follows with the infancy, uh, infancy narratives. Then the next thing is beginning of John and Jesus. So it's a ministry of John the Baptist, then Jesus uh, uh, baptism and temptation. This follow uh, then with the Galilean ministry. Then it goes on uh, to the journey to Jerusalem. And later uh, the Jerusalem ministry, the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection and ascension. So it follows this order. Now, next thing we want to see and we read is about Luke's orderly account. Now, Luke tells us in his chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 that many people had written about Jesus and the, and the early church, but apparently he didn't think those accounts were adequate to the task of assuring Theopolis that this was all true. So, he investigated all and wrote an orderly account. Now, Luke apparently used part of the mark, perhaps the collection of Jesus uh, saying. Now, Jesus Q saying is basically saying of Jesus, which were common in all the synoptic gospel. And some material is unique to Luke. But the, another question that comes, how orderly is Luke gospel? Does the order means sequence? So let's see. Now the Greek word uh, order is also used in Acts chapter 11 verse 4. Peter explained everything to them in an orderly sequence. Now to understand what Luke means by orderly, we need to compare Peter's story and Luke's story, Peter's story in Acts 11 and Luke's story in Acts 10. Now let's see. Now we can see that Peter's explanation is not strictly chronological. Peter begins the story with his vision in chapter 11 verse 5, although Luke has already told the readers that two other events happened earlier. And what were though? Uh, Cornelius had a vision and sent two servants to Joppa as we read it in chapter 10 verse 1 to 8. But in Peter's orderly account, he does not mention the servants until the point in the story when he learned about them. Now, although the servants told Peter about Cornelius vision of, uh, of an angel, Peter does not mention that. According to Peter's account, he does not learn about the angel until Cornelius himself tell him. Now, what Peter says is not false, but it is not strictly chronological. 
the same is also true for luke gospel the order that luke gives to the story is designed to persuade the reader not to give a precise sequence of event okay it it, it flows us in the direction but we should not take it that this happened then so the meaning of this then now it's not one after another let me give another illustration now luke begins jesus ministry in luke chapter 4 verses 14 now after after two summary verses about galilee luke tells us about an incident in the nazareth synagogue as we read in chapter 4 verse 16 to 30 but now when we see that we read this incident we should not assume that this is where Jesus has started his ministry in Nazareth because in Luke chapter 4 verse 23 we read that he had Jesus had already done notable works in Capernaum. So, so Luke had a literary reason to begin his story in Nazareth. The incident is a summary of Jesus entire ministry from his mission statement, the initial favorable reaction to uh, of the audience his expulsion from the synagogue and an attempt to kill him. The Nazareth story set the stage for all the other stories to follow. Now, one, sto one technique Luke uses is to present many of the stories in the setting of a trip from Galilee to Jerusalem. You would see this narrative. Okay. And we read that in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, with Jesus. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And then we read it in Luke chapter 13, 18 and 19 says that Jesus was still on his way to Jerusalem and implies that everything that happened between chapter 9 verse 50, uh, 51 to chapter 19 verse 21 happened on this trip. But we should not conclude that that means that Jesus has only made one trip to Jerusalem because several intervening events were in Galilee uh, or Jerusalem and we read that in Matthew and Mark. So we should not see this as a sequence. Now Luke presents it as a journey because Jesus ministry was in a way figuratively saying a one way trip towards his death in Jerusalem. What Luke doesn't tell us is that all the times that Jesus went back to Galilee and began his journey towards Jerusalem again. He doesn't mention that. And this is not to say that Luke is wrong. It is to just help us in to avoid incorrect assumption about what orderly means. Now, after knowing all this thing, let's see what theological themes we see in the gospel of Luke. Now, the first one the history and the gospel. Now, Luke provides a historical backing to the Christian message that will strengthen the faith of the existing and also will lead to new people in faith as we read it in chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 because he reassures, he does the careful study and then he proves. He see himself as more than a writer of a story or that he may not be a historical but he see more than a writer. The story has a force only if it recounts salvation history. That is, God's uh, plan of salvation of humanity happens right from the Old Testament until now. That's the first thing. Second, we see God and his purpose. Now, God is active in the history, in this history and takes the initiative through his various agents and other means. A divine plan is being put into effect as prophesied in the scripture, if you read Luke chapter 1 verses 69 to 70 and verse 73 and 75, you see that the, the prophecy uh, is, of the plan is prophesied and it involves Jesus in obedience to a destiny that he must fulfill. Now, even with this, yet people respond freely to God and when they pray to him, not only in praise and thanksgiving, but also in petition, asking him to do the things with the expectation that he will respond by answering to them. So he had a favorable response as well. Nevertheless, what has been prophesied will be fulfilled because the ultimate author of a prophecies has the ability to fulfill them. You know, what has prophesied that Christ will take on 
our sin and he will um, die for our sin is prophesied. Now the next thing, consequently various events takes place as it is written in the book of uh, Luke. You always see as it is written, you see in uh, chapter 3, 7, 18, 22, 24 and so on. <clears throat> You also see God's plan constrain Jesus to obedience that involves suffering. We see that uh, Jesus goes through suffering. The next theme that we see is a people in need of salvation. Now Luke's story is concerned with the renewal of people of Israel, many of whom have fallen away from their God and turned themselves into sinner as we see in Luke uh, chapter 1 verse 16. Now some are devout and keep God's commandment, but Luke shares the view of other early Christian and of a various sectarian Jewish group that the people as a whole and especially their leaders have fallen away from God. So that's why people need salvation. Now failure to recognize and respond to God's message through Jesus and to Jesus himself become the most characteristic expression of sin. And we read that throughout the book of Luke. And the next aspect is salvation. God the Savior brings a Savior, Christ the Lord, to his people to save the entire humanity. Now the coming of John is the first step in rising up of a horn. Uh, that is you read it, uh, horn of salvation that you read it in chapter verse uh, 1 verse 69. Now the redemption or deliverance of Israel could be literally uh, referring to the coming of Messiah who would cast out foreign powers that ruled the Jews. But the rest of the story hardly encouraged such an interpretation. You know, the language of warfare and victory is used metaphorically to celebrate the redemptive activity of God. Correct? Similarly, the Nazareth manifesto of Jesus could be taken in literal terms of release of the oppressed <coughs> and recovery of slight for the blind and good news for the poor could refer to economic elevation. One second. Yet despite the signs and wonders that bring sight and healing. So that means the deliverance brought by Jesus is basic, basically spiritual with wider effects. But the people there were expecting salvation in terms of uh, getting rid of the, the Romans and establishing a military power. But his deliverance is basically on the spiritual level. Then mercy and judgment. Now the theme of reversal is very prominent in Luke than elsewhere. Now you would see what is the theme of reversal. Basically, you follow law, you're okay. But here with Jesus, we, we go on grace and mercy. So this theme of reversal is very prominent in Luke and elsewhere. Jesus bring into open the division. Uh, he, he shares openly the division in the society. Now the often offer of salvation <clears throat> is very much for the poor and weak. Now these are the neediest people, literal poverty and other wants to go hand in hand. Now these people need salvation, need the mercy. Now Luke describes Jesus' concern for the sinner and for the woman and other marginalized group including the Samaritans and foreigners. Now these people are also most open to the message of Jesus and find salvation. The next uh, theological theme that we see in the uh, book of uh, the Gospel of Luke is the promise and fulfillment. Now Luke uses this temporal structure of the two periods of promises and fulfillment. The latter being the time of Jesus and that of church. Now Jesus contrasts the former period of law and the prophet with the present time in which the good news of the kingdom is being proclaimed. The sorry good news of the um, uses proclaim now Jesus uh, the proclamation continues after the death and resurrection of Jesus as the follower of Jesus also make the kingdom as the object of their preaching now however you should see 
that Luke makes more use than Mark and Matthew of the vocabulary of salvation to indicate its significance. You will see a lot of uh, focus on salvation or the words related to salvation with example in Luke than you see in Mark and uh, Matthew. The next theological theme we see is Jesus the Savior. Now the opening announcement of the birth of Jesus that we read it in uh, early chapter brings together the name Jesus. Divine sonship and Davidic descendant is much the same way as we see in Matthew uh, chapter 1 and 2. Now you will see that the messiahship is a thread running common across all the gospels. Now although the anointing in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 is more uh, of a prof prophetic anointing, the job description that were assigned were more of a uh, prophet which suggests that the role of a prophet and king is amalgamated in Christ. Yeah. Now next thing is um, this the strong Elijah Elisha uh, uh, topology confirmed that Jesus is the counterpart of these two prophets. Jesus also described his own activity as fulfilling the prophecies of the divine blessing in the coming age, as we read it in Luke chapter 7, verse 22 and 35. And this raised the possibility that he has to be seen as the end time prophet like Moses who again is a messianic type of figure that we read it in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15 to 19. Now Jesus acts prophetically as a proclaimer of God's word announcing the good news that the kingdom is present in power. It is a mission of compassion towards the needy but is also accomplished accompanied by the expression of deep sorrow for the impenitent because of the impending judgment for those who are rejecting the message. Then the next theme we see is the mission to Israel and Gentiles. As in the other gospel, Jesus work best is summarized as a mission. Now the task of John is preaching the good news and the word of Isaiah, uh, which is through the word of Isaiah 61 verse 1. Make the same point for Jesus. Similarly, when the disciple go out on a mission, they preach the good news about the kingdom of God and they heal everyone. Now Luke records the two mission of the 12 and of the 72. The numerical symbolism indicate that mission of both Jews and Gentile is foreshadows in these accounts. The mission is primarily to Israel where not only those generally recognized as sinners, but all alike are seen to be in need of uh, salvation. The proclamation of the kingdom of God demands a response from all the people. And it does effect, or it does has an effect of compelling people to renew their commitment to God. Now, the <clears throat> this involves accepting Jesus um, as a son of God, authorized to demand allegiance on his behalf. Although the gospel has strongly allegiance on this, be, uh, uh, as a strongly Jewish favor, there are repeated indication that the ultimate scope of uh, salvation also include the Gentiles. And this is very apparent in the Luke chapter 2 and Luke chapter 3. The next, the everlasting kingdom. Now the reign of Messiah, Jesus is forever, as we read it in Luke chapter 1 verse 33. Teaching about the future coming is found in two main passages, uh, Luke chapter 17 and in chapter 21. They are worded more openly about the forthcoming destruction of Jerusalem and its remaining desolate until the time of Gentiles are fulfilled. That makes, Jesus makes it quite clear that people's, people must at all times live in the readiness for the end and they should not be taken unaware of it. We should be ready all the time That's the uh, to, to leave this uh, kingdom. 
Now Luke also powerfully says how the follower of Jesus have the task laid upon them to being the witness to Jesus in the intervening uh, period until Jesus uh, makes his second um, coming. We have a task to witness uh, Christ to the rest. So now as we go towards the conclusion, let's do the summary. Now we'll do summary into the summary of the book of uh, the summary of the gospel according to Luke and then we'll do the theological summary as well. Now the first part is Luke gospel was originally the first scroll of the two volume. Luke being first, Acts second. These uh, two volume, they constitute one quarter of the entire New Testament and thus being the largest New Testament book. Luke's story is mainly about the offer of salvation to those who are on the outside and those who are marginalized by the society. The early church is unanimous that the author is Luke and the Colossians suggest that he is a Gentile. The Gospel of Luke was uh, written around AD 60 and the author's main interest lies in the presentation of God's salvation as revealed in Jesus Christ because uh, I, I again quote uh, Ian Howard Marshall when he says whereas the stress in Mark is on the person of Jesus Matthew on teaching of Jesus and in John on the manifestation of eternal life Luke's stress is on the blessing of salvation which he brings. Now the two volumes, Acts and Luke narrate a single continuous story. The, both the books are structured in a same common theme that appear in both the volumes. Then we saw Luke's orderly account in the Gospel of Luke where we, and we, uh, we today learn that the order that Luke gives to the story is designed to persuade the user, reader not to give a precise sequence of events. And what are the theological theme? Now, the theological emphasis in this gospel arrange themselves naturally around the broad theme of God's purpose to bring salvation to the Jews and Gentiles alike through the activity of his missionary agent Jesus who function as a prophet and a Messiah. Now, if Jesus is a prophet in Luke, he is more of a teacher in uh, Matthew, where Mark and Matthew present Jesus' message more in terms of kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. Luke has a more salvation thrust. It's more specific to about salvation. Then we see Jesus assumes the need and sinfulness of human being in much the same way as Mark and Matthew. Then Luke reports the teaching of Jesus about the rule of God, but stresses about the action offers um, to people and call them to repentance. Then we see the continuity between what Jesus offers in his lifetime and what the church preaches after his resurrection is made very obvious. And we also see that there is more stress on Jesus authoritative position as Lord even before his resurrection and exaltation in the book of uh, Luke. Then we see that Jesus calls his disciples and send them out to share his mission as we read it in, and in Matthew and we read it in Mark. His mission was primarily set for Israel, but it foreshadows the wider mission to the Gentiles. Then there is perhaps more stress on Jesus' compassion for the poor and needy. And this reinforces the command to love that Jesus gives his disciples, you see in emphasis in Luke. Now, Jesus' death is to be seen as a sacrificial and redemptive, and as one of the theological themes. And then his view of the future is much the same as it is in Mark and Matthew. So this summarizes uh, our, our re review, uh, not review, a uh, survey of the book, um, uh, a gospel according to Luke and next time we, when we meet we are going to cover about so references remain same I continue to take uh, my reading and learning from uh, the these two books and the class lessons, lessons through Michael Morrison's Dr. Morrison's New Testament survey next week we are going to talk about the skeptics attack uh, attack on the gospel and the Jesus Conference, many of you would know and we will have an interesting discussion then.
and we'll also uh, talk about the evidence of accuracy of the gospel so that we will cover next week that brings to an end uh, to today's lesson are there any comments uh, or any question that i can clarify and answer If no question, then help me with one thing. In your own personal reading, how does the the concept of salvation came to you in your own reading, the book of the uh, the, the the gospel according to Luke? Has it been so? Um, what do you say? Has it been so vocal as we saw today uh, in in your reading before? Or this reading has making it more focal and then perhaps you can go down then and see. Or also the focus on the uh, lower uh, category people who are marginalized by the society and the focus and, and the mention of them as a part of the overall plan of salvation that is also very uh, much um, in focus here so any comment on that as well Oh, otherwise, I'll give you one more question that will make all of you at least to unmute and talk. How do you see the role of Holy Spirit inspiring each of this? Now we have covered Matthew, Mark, and we are on Luke before we jump into uh, John in the future. How do you think the Holy Spirit is inspiring them to write the same story, but with a very different focus, sometimes re-emphasizing on the same thing, but something covering different things and just helping us to to see the overall plan of God. Any comment on that? Yes, sir. Well, the Holy Spirit has obviously inspired all the authors of the Bible, no question about it. But at the same time, uh, their their uh, particular personalities are reflected and their particular uh, vocabularies and style of writing is still their own but the uh, the uh, inspiration and and being led by the holy spirit is very clear and uh, as it is all <clears throat> also mentioned that all scriptures were given by the inspiration of god so you know the, the the inspiration is there and the leading of the holy spirit is there but each author brings his own characteristic and style and motivation into the thing that's my thinking correct because he he has certain focus of certain audiences to whom he is writing and i think when we know <clears throat> the audiences and situation it is making it more the, the personality is more coming out as we see right and uh, the, the thing about salvation, you mentioned how uh, certainly, of course, Luke, as you mentioned, is very focused on or very, uh, it, he emphasizes salvation a lot more. But I think the full understanding of salvation, how and all that is supplemented when we read, uh, of course, uh, Romans and Ephesians, where, you know, salvation by grace alone, faith alone and all that. So uh, this this certainly is emphasizing salvation, but those two, if you couple it with this, it's explaining more as to how and by what means. Paul takes it much further. Um, Correct. Mr. Poppins, you are unmuted. Any comments from your side? Anything you would like to add? <clears throat> 
Anything from your side, Praveen? Um, basically, you have covered most of the things in such a descriptive manner in such a short period of time also. <laughs> that was uh, wonderful. And uh, two things I usually notice, especially when I read Book of Luke in comparison with uh, other Gospels, is number one is uh, uh, Luke speaks so much about social justice. And uh, other Gospels are not very much... Uh, into it as uh, you have also mentioned uh, that Jesus goes and meets and talks to unconventional people uh, and uh, some of his parables are uh, about them and uh, such values that is one thing another thing uh, I sometimes notice especially especially when you compare it with Mark I feel like Luke he already got a picture of uh, Christ and he already got a proper Christology of Christ. With that perspective, he writes the story of Christ uh, because of which in certain places uh, uh, he uh, where uh, the divinity of Christ are like, you know, are not very greatly visible. Uh, like uh, in certain places where it is written, Jesus could not do much miracles because they didn't people didn't have faith. And that Mark's writes and Luke, when it comes, he doesn't, uh, he just uh, slowly, he he takes his attention from there. He doesn't mention any of those because he already set up his perspective, uh, his Christological perspective. And, uh, and at the same time, he highlights the humanity of Jesus Christ and uh, uh, where uh, he, exp he explains about uh, his sufferings, but at the same time, uh, he doesn't compromise on uh, the divine qualities he wanted to show and the kind of power and authority he wanted to show that he doesn't do. Uh, of course, when John comes, he goes to extreme. And uh, like, uh, if you see uh, arrest of Jesus, uh, arrest of Jesus, uh, uh, where uh, John takes uh, so many legions of people have come. And when Jesus said, I am, they fell on the ground. Like that, but when it comes to Luke, he doesn't express in those terms. But he wanted to focus more on the humanity of Jesus, where he goes and says, uh, uh, "He was sweating, uh, he was tensed and sweating in such a way where he he was bleeding through the sweat." So uh, he made his Christology very clear, and then he brings the gospel narrative uh, through that. But when it comes to Mark and all, it looks more like a little raw. Uh, just directly they bring uh, the stories uh, like this. And uh, uh, Luke, uh, he gives a very good context of everything. And uh, unlike uh, other Gospels. So it makes it very easy for us to understand uh, the life of Jesus Christ, especially uh, very well when we read uh, <coughs> book of, uh, especially book of Luke. Another thing I feel very much is all the other Gospels, uh, they are focused on one particular theme and going to focus that aspect of uh, Jesus and the Gospel. But when it comes to G uh, Luke, it looks more like, you know, he wanted to give a sincere biography of Jesus also, a simple biography of Jesus also, so in a very descriptive manner. And that I sometimes I feel when I read uh, this gospel in comparison with others. Correct, correct. Very right on point. I think uh, both Matthew uh, and Luke, they felt what Mark wrote, they can depend upon. So they used the framework, but then how they wanted to, they used that framework and then they continued. Like, as you rightly said, uh, Luke is the, in, in, in the book of Luke, you see Luke calling Jesus during his lifetime Lord. Now, Matthew calls him out of respect, respect. And reverence, but here is the Lord, you know, before, because after Easter, after his resurrection, he is the Lord, but then before Luke very uh, forcefully says, and then the beauty of it is as he moves into his second um, volume, you see everything in action, right? So that, that's an amazing thing. So you see Jesus in action, now you see disciples in action. And, and that the whole story flows. So that I felt is beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Even uh, Luke 1 starts with, uh, uh, he explains uh, the Caesar, Caesar Augustus, who had been the king of the world or the emperor of the world, 
and in connection luke's uh, acts last chapter he ends with apostle paul preaching jesus as the lord uh, in uh, in in rome itself so uh, we, what you mentioned is very clearly visible that uh, he is coming from a very clear perspective about who jesus is and uh, uh, he brings that also uh, into his narrative about uh, the gospel and the point you mentioned about theophilus uh, that's a beautiful thought it can be addressed to one person or it, to all people who love god and uh, that that's quite uh, interesting well uh, if there are no further comments or addition then may i request anil to lead us in the closing prayer okay let's pray <clears throat> almighty god in heaven father we are so very grateful for your blessings for the opportunities you give us father lord <clears throat> you are such a loving and gracious god and we are so very grateful for this opportunity to, to meet to discuss to glorify you lord we pray may you continue to teach us and give us more and more spiritual understanding and insight particularly in the life of jesus his teachings father and lord the the, the salvation that he offers us lord almighty god help us that we keep keep our focus on jesus all the time yes. Partic particularly in this trying times that the world is going through such an upheaval in every possible way we need to keep our focus on jesus because he is the he is the only sure thing he is our anchor so god help us that we continue to delve deep into your word lord and continue to just inspire us and help us god to be shining lights as we go forth so thank you lord for all this we pray for our blessing on all of us and all those who may not have be able to attend this lord continue to guide us in every way and dismiss us now lord we pray and ask all this in jesus name amen amen thank you so amen. much Adil, and uh, such a timely reminder for us to refocus ourselves on jesus where everything else might take our attention and priority because everything else will look important but the right yes mm -hmm. but we have to put back the focus on jesus thank you yes